So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren. I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. This podcast is a mixtape of three stories that focus on three different topics to help us think more deeply about the way we're walking through our lives. You can find all the work that I do on my website under www.josiesartschool.com or you can find me on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren. The first is from a book called The Crossroads of Should and Must by L. Luna. It was 9 a.m. at my job on Thursday, February 7th, when we shared our app with the world. The launch was an unmitigated success, and I knew that this moment was one of the highlights of my life. In the back of my mind, I couldn't help wondering what any of it had to do with my dream of a white room. I was sitting at my desk when the crossroads appeared. The choice was clear. Two worlds, equally appealing, but they were different. I looked at my finances, saw that I could buy myself a few months to try to make a living as an artist, and I put in my two weeks notice. I had no idea what I was doing. I knew exactly what I was doing. Let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love It will not lead you astray. Rumi. There are two paths in life, should and must. We arrive at this crossroads over and over again. And every day we get to choose. Should is how other people want us to live our lives. It's all of the expectations that others layer upon us. Sometimes, shoulds are small, seemingly innocuous, and easily accommodated. You should listen to that song, for example. At other times, shoulds are highly influential systems of thought that pressure, and at their most destructive, coerce us to live our lives differently. When we choose should, We're choosing to live our life for someone or something other than ourselves. The journey to should can be smooth. The rewards can seem clear. And the options are often plentiful. Must is different. Must is who we are, what we believe, and what we do when we are alone with our truest, most authentic self. It's that, it's that which calls us most deeply. It's our convictions, our passions, our deepest held urges and desires. Unavoidable, undeniable, and inexplicable. Unlike should, must doesn't accept compromises. Must is when we stop conforming to other people's ideas and start connecting to our own. And this allows us to cultivate our full potential as individuals. To choose must is to say yes to hard work and constant effort. To say yes to a journey without a roadmap or guarantees. And in so doing, to say yes to what Joseph Campbell called 
the experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonance within our innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. Choosing must is the greatest thing we can do with our lives. Some words from The Right to Write by Julia Cameron. In our current culture, something much less healthy is afoot. Writing is not forbidden, it is discouraged. Hallmark does it for us. We shop for the card that is closest to what we wish to say. Schools drill us about how to say what we want and how and the how-to involves things like proper spelling, topic sentences, and the avoidance of detours so that logic becomes the field marshal and emotion is kept at bay. Writing, as we are taught to do it, becomes an anti-human activity. We are forever editing, leaving out the details that might not be pertinent. We are trained to self-doubt, to self-scrutiny in the place of self-expression. As a result, most of us try to write too carefully. We try to do it right. We try to sound smart. We try, period. Writing goes much better when we don't work at it so much. When we give ourselves permission to just hang out on the page. For me, writing is like a good pair of pajamas. Comfortable. In our culture, writing is more often costumed up in a military outfit. We want our sentences to march in neat little rows, like well-behaved boarding school children. Burn down the school. Save the books, perhaps, but get the teacher to tell you the real secrets. What does he write and read as a guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure is what writing is all about. It is about attractions, words, you can't resist using to describe things too interesting to pass up. And forget lofty motives. I don't write from lofty motives. I never have. In sixth grade, when I got my first very short stories, it was to snag the attention of Peter Mundy. Peter Mundy was a newcomer to St. Joseph's grade school, Miss Kloff's class. He'd moved north from Missouri. He brought a southern accent and chestnut hair, hair the color of a jar of Tupelo honey, a physical look as sweet as the something southern that whispered through the, his voice. I wanted Peter to be my boyfriend. I wanted him to notice me. And so I set about wooing him by writing him stories. Twenty years later, long after he dated Peggy Conroy instead of me, Peter told me I had captured his heart with my writing. I'd just chickened out. Peter may have chickened out, but in the act of chasing him with pencil and paper, I discovered a bigger chase, the thrill of chasing anything with words. Writing is a lot like driving a country blacktop highway on a hot summer day. There is a wavery, magical spot that shimmers on the horizon. You aim toward it. You speed to get there. And when you do, the there vanishes. You look up to see it again shimmering in the distance. You write toward that. I, some, I suppose some people might call this unrequited love or dissatisfaction. I think it's something better. I think it's anticipation. I think it's savoring. I think it's tasting a great meal from its scent on your nostrils. I do not have to eat freshly baked bread to love it. The scent is nearly as delicious nearly as much the satisfaction as the thick slice of bread slathered with butter and homemade apricot jam. The brain enjoys writing. It enjoys the act of naming things. 
the processes of association and discernment. Picking words is like picking apples. This one looks delicious. The Loon by Mary Oliver Not quite 4 a.m. when the rapture of being alive strikes me from sleep. And I rise from the comfortable bed and go to another room where my books are lined up in their neat, colorful rows. How magical they are. I choose one and open it. Soon I have wandered in over the waves of the words to the temple of thought. And then I hear outside, over the actual waves, the small, perfect voice of the loon. He is also awake, and with his heavy head uplifted, he calls out to the fading moon, to the pink flesh swelling in the east that soon will become the long reasonable day inside the house it is still dark except for the pool of lamplight in which I am writing I do not close the book neither for a long while do I read on